So we're looking here at an anterior view of a right shoulder model. And we can tell it's the right because we can tell it's anterior. Here we've got the coracoid process, which is going to be in the anterior aspect. And we can see the subscapular fossa quite clearly here, which again is on the anterior aspect of the scapula. Here's the lesser tubicle on the humerus. So and again, that's an anterior landmark. So we know we're looking at a, an anterior view of a right shoulder region. We can see, firstly, a large structure right here the glenohumeral capsule. Now with this structure on this model, the, the makers of the model in their wisdom have decided not to put the entire structure on there. So this, this is the glenohumeral capsule here on the anterior surface. Here we can see it from an interior point of view, uh, inferior point of view. Here we can see the posterior aspect of it. Now what they've done though, if we bring it back to an anterior point of view and then have a look from a slightly superior view, what they've done is they've removed or, or haven't put on this part of the capsule. So they've left a bit of it open so that we can see these other structures. So this structure here would actually be deep to the capsule. It actually goes inside the capsule and that's a tendon. So that's not a structure that you have to know for this week, but it's the tendon of the long head of biceps brachii. So that's one there. It's not on your list, but it's good to know. I suppose what it is when you're looking at the the um, the model, so that you don't think that it's part of the capsule. So this is the capsule here. The capsule in life would extend, of course, right around the joint. There wouldn't be any gap there because then the capsule just wouldn't work as a capsule. So the capsule would be continuous. Now this other structure here is a ligament. It's the coracohumeral ligament. Now again, it's not on your list. I'm just pointing it out so that you know. It's a structure that you don't need to identify this session. Okay, but importantly for us, this session, this is the glenohumeral joint capsule here. Now the other structure uh, that's not a ligament that's on the list for today is the glenoid labrum. Now the labrum, remember labrum means lip, and it's a lip of fibrocartilage that runs around the outside, the outer rim, of the glenoid cavity. Now let's just zoom in a bit and have a look because it's my theory that on this model what they mean to be the uh, glenoid labrum is this little lip in here. Now I could be wrong. They may not actually, the makers of the model may have not intended for that to be it, but that's about where it would be. It's a little lip of fibrocartilage around the edge of the glenoid cavity and it acts like a suction cup to help hold the head of the humerus, which we're looking at here, in place. Okay, and that is just where it would be. And that's approximately what it looks like. It's just this little lip here on the edge. Um, now, fortunately, we do have a specimen that has a very good clenoid labrum. So you'll be able to see the real thing because it'd be pretty hard for me to get a pin on that one and pin it in an exam. But I reckon that's what they were getting at there with the, that structure there on the model. Okay, now then we have the coracoacromial ligament. Now the great news is if you know that this is the coracoid process and that this is the acromion, the coracoacromial ligament is pretty easy to spot and it's right here. So there's the coracoacromial ligament. If you know the bones, then that won't come as any surprise to you. You could work out that one just by knowing the, the bony structures. Then we have an acromioclavicular ligament. Now, if we just look from a more superior point of view here, here's our clavicle, here's our acromion. So the acromioclavicular ligament is going to be here. It's on the superior aspect of the acromioclavicular joint. Now, when I was younger, a long time ago, this structure down here was considered to be the inferior acromioclavicular ligament, and this one the superior acromioclavicular ligament, but it's been decided since then that this one is not really big enough to be considered a ligament, the inferior one. So now that's just considered to be part of the joint capsule and only this part here on the superior aspect is considered to be the acromioclavicular ligament. So that's it there. There's only one now. That's the acromioclavicular ligament there. Now, then we've got two ligaments that are running from the coracoid process to the clavicle.
And again, if you know the bones well from last week, you'll know that this one here is attaching to the conoid tubercle. And this um, plastic skeleton has a really large conoid tubercle here that you can see this ligament attaching into. So that's the conoid ligament. It's the more medial of the two. This one here is the trapezoid ligament. Remember, the trapezoid line is lateral to the conoid tubercle. So that's the trapezoid ligament there. So conoid, more medial, trapezoid, more lateral. Now these are really quite strong ligaments. Together, that they form the coracoclavicular ligament. Now you don't have to identify them as such with that. You only have, on, on your list it just says conoid and trapezoid ligaments, so you only have to identify them separately. But just to let you know, together they form the coracoclavicular ligament and they're very strong and they support this acromioclavicular joint even though they're not actually part of the joint capsule because these two ligaments here stop the clavicle from being able to move away from the scapula or, or vice versa. So essentially the scapula and the humerus and the rest of your upper limb is hanging off the clavicle by these ligaments. And if you were to dislocate your acromioclavicular joint, the, the lateral end of the clavicle would stick up. But if you dislocate the acromioclavicular joint and you tear the coracoclavicular ligament, both the conoid and trapezoid ligaments, then your, your upper limb is basically dangling and is not connected to your axial skeleton at all anymore because the only place the upper limb is connected to the axial skeleton is here at the sternoclavicular joint. So if you separate these structures here, basically the clavicle is still connected, but the scapula and everything else on the upper limb are not anymore. So if someone has done that dislocation, or dislocation and tearing this ligament here, the lateral end of the clavicle will be sticking up. You will be able to see that, but the lower limb will also be kind of dangling up the lower limb. The upper limb, the lower limb won't, probably won't be affected if they <laughs> to damage their shoulder. You'd be surprised to know. The upper limb will be kind of dangling. It won't be, it will no longer be connected to the axial skeleton. Okay, so on that cheerful note, um, that's what you need to know in the shoulder region. So now let's have a quick look at the elbow. So here we've got, again, an anterior view of a right elbow region, and we can tell that because we know it's anterior because we can see capitulum and trochlea and two fossae just proximal to those condyles. Uh, if, if we could just see one condyle, the trochlea, and one big fossa, we'd be looking at the back. Uh, we know that this is medial. That's the medial epicondyle. You can see that's so much larger than the lateral. So we know we're looking at an anterior view of a right um, elbow region. That means this must be the ulna on the medial side and this must be the radius on the lateral side. Now with the with a lot of joints, and please accept my apologies, this one's slightly damaged so it's not, the bones are not sitting exactly as they should, um, but um, with um, a lot of joints there are collateral ligaments and collateral means it's on the side. So there'll be a radial collateral ligament out this side and you can see there that the fibres are kind of vertical there. Okay, hopefully you can see that comes out on the, the screen okay. And then on the ulna side, on the medial side, there'll be an ulna collateral ligament. Now the fibres aren't all vertical there, they run in a few different directions. But all of this, this big broad ligament here, is the ulna collateral ligament. So the collaterals are either side. Then we have an annular ligament. Now the annular ligament, it does blend with the radial collateral, so it can be a bit tricky to tell which is which. Fortunately though, on, the, on this plastic and rubber model, the fibres are pretty well shown on the, on the rubber part, which is the ligaments. So here we had the radial collateral, where the fibres are vertical. Here we have the annular, where the fibres are horizontal, and they're running around the head of the radius. So when there's supination and pronation happening, you can see the head of the radius there moving under the annular ligament. You can see how it rotates there. So that's the purpose of the annular ligament, to hold the head of the radius in place. It attaches to the ulna here on the anterior aspect, wraps around the head of the radius, and attaches to the ulna on the posterior aspect. So it doesn't go right around the elbow, but it does go right around the head of the radius. 
So if I was going to pin this, this annular ligament, I pin it somewhere where you can clearly see that the fibres are horizontal and not vertical like they are here with the radial collateral. Now notice that the fibres do blend and you can see that they're joining here on the, on the model. You can see that they, they kind of blend with each other. So I wouldn't pin it somewhere here where it could really, you could say either. Okay, so if I want radial collateral ligament here, if I want annular ligament here, okay, or, or somewhere similar where you can clearly see the direction of the fibres. Okay, so that's a few structures around the elbow. Now on that particular model we were just looking at, uh, there wasn't actually an interosseous membrane. So let's have a look at this one where we've got a, a ligamentous hand, so we can see the bones of the hand and forearm and ligaments. But the only one we're interested in today is this one here, which is the interosseous membrane in between the radius and ulna.